There are four main attributes of concepts that emerge in the first half of chapter one. Deleuze and Guattari tell us that every concept has components, every concept has a history, every concept is connected to some problem or another that it's supposed to address, and finally, every concept is in turn related to other concepts. And the most basic of these four assertions is that every concept has components. In fact, as we'll see, these other three assertions are sort of built upon this more basic one. And by basic, I of course don't mean simple. Deleuze and Guattari tell us there are no simple concepts. Rather, I just mean that the assertion that every concept has components is what allows these other assertions to emerge and makes them make sense. So we'll want to first understand what uh, Deleuze and Guattari mean when they say that every concept has components, but at the same time we'll want to establish some preliminaries on the word concept, which as of yet we haven't really gotten a positive definition of. On page 21 Deleuze and Guattari tell us that concepts are incorporeal, but they instantiate themselves in bodies. Put more simply, this means that concepts are thought objects that instantiate or express themselves in physical objects. Here's an example. This green wall that I'm touching is a, it's a body, it's a physical object. It's not a concept. But there are concepts called green, and there's a concept of wall, and my familiarity with these concepts allows me to look at this and say, that's a green wall. The word concept comes from the Latin concepere, which means to take together. And we use this word and its derivations in a lot of areas. One common application of the word concept and its derivation conception is in sexual reproduction, where a sperm cell and an egg cell come together and form a new cell. So we could say that the components of this new cell are the egg and sperm. In philosophy, rather than egg and sperm, the components of philosophical concepts are going to be other thought objects. Of course, it gets even trickier when we find Deleuze and Guattari telling us that every concept's components are, in many cases, concepts in their own right. So a concept is made up of other concepts, this sounds like circular reasoning. So at this point, it probably helps to have an example. Let's take, for example, a concept in philosophy, probably especially ethics, that I hope is fairly accessible. The concept of human rights, rights which one has by virtue of being human. What would we like to say the components of the concept of human rights would be? Well, I think we have two. We have Con uh, the component human, and we have the component right. But a good way to tell whether your components are also concepts is if you can ask the question, what is that thing? And if you can expect a relatively complex answer. And I think that's true of both human and right. We can say, what is a human? What does it mean to be human? What is a right? What does it mean to have a right versus, say, a privilege? We'll return to this example as we work our way through the other main attributes of concepts in this part of the chapter. But for now, I want to turn our attention to some other things that Deleuze and Guattari say about components. They tell us that components define the concept. And keep in mind that when, when they say that they define the concept, they define it negatively. They define it in terms of what it is not. I've included a quote from Ferdinand de Saussure, the Swiss linguist who had a great deal of influence on continental thought in the 20th century. And this is just a, it's a paraphrase from a, a quote from his general course on linguistics, or course on general linguistics, um, where he says that the principal characteristic of a concept is in being what other concepts are not, is in its difference from other concepts. And this is a major theme of continental thought is negative, differential, relational definitions. There is no positive meaning. There is only the meaning of a term in, in its relationship to other terms within a system. And this is very apparent in the thought and work of Deleuze and Guattari. So this is all very in keeping with the continental tradition that they're working within. So when we say that components define their concepts, Let's return to our example of the green wall 
and our new example of human rights. What concepts components do is essentially they form the boundaries of a concept. And, and I think we talked about this in the introduction, that for Deleuze it's very important that a concept has uh, some kind of boundaries, otherwise it's just meaningless. You know, in other when we say that a concept has boundaries, we mean it's easy to tell that this is one thing and some other concept is different from this. If you can't tell what the difference between one concept is and another, then you need to work on your conceptualization because it's not very clear. But I think it's very apparent that the concept of a green wall has basically no relationship to the concept of human right. And Deleuze and Guattari are basically turning the microscope onto the components in terms of the green wall would be green and wall, and the components of human and, and rights, which sets up this nice neat boundary. So if you want to talk about the green wall, I don't know how interesting a conversation that would be, or if you want to talk about the human rights concept, which I think would be more fruitful, you can do that now because you know that you're talking about two different things, which may seem fairly obvious, but remember, we're building from more basic assumptions up to more complex ones. Now, secondly, Deleuze and Guattari tell us that concepts are the condensation point of their components. I thought a Venn di diagram was the most helpful way to represent this idea. So H and R stand for human and and right, the concept of human and the concept of right. The concept of a human right is going to necessarily contain elements of the concept of human, and it's going to contain elements of the concept of right, just like with our, in our discussion of, of re reproduction with cells. Each cell will have some components. Uh, each new cell will have components of the two cells that conceive it. Same with the philosophical co uh, concept. It will have components from each of the other concepts that make it up. Last point I want to make on the issue of components of concepts. How many components does it take to make a concept? I suppose it could vary. Some concepts may have many components, some may only have a few. But for any concept's number of components, Deleuze and Guattari tell us that we can say two things about that number. That no concept will have only one component, and no concept will have every component. So the number of any given concept, in terms of how many components it has, will be somewhere between 2 and infinity. Why can't a concept have just one component, though? Maybe we think there's got to be some concept that just, just has one component. Well, that wouldn't really follow from the definition of concept, even if we just take that to be the general sense of the word concept, bringing together implies that you're bringing together two things. If you have one thing, you're not bringing together anything. There's another reason too, which is that every concept in a way implies its opposite. Think of the concept of stop, which you may see instantiated in a body known as a stop sign. Can we define stop purely by saying that its component is stop? I mean, if someone asks you, if someone's learning how to drive and they say, what does it mean to stop? How can you say, well, it just means stop? If they don't know what that means, that doesn't really help them. A big component of the concept of stopping, interestingly enough, is the concept of going. In this case, it would be not going, because if you're stopping, you're not going, and if you're going, you're not stopping. So every concept, in a way, implies its opposite, and every concept needs at least another component to define it differentially. It's important to define things in terms of what they're not, otherwise it's just meaningless. That's basically the end result of trying to look for a concept with every component, too. It's a kind of meaninglessness. Deleuze and Guattari term, term it chaos. And despite the way that Deleuze and Guattari write, which some may think is a little chaotic and disorganized, they take chaos very seriously, and they want to avoid chaos. Chaos, for them, means a concept that has every component you could possibly imagine, and every component that maybe hasn't even been thought yet. Such an idea is absurd to them. Or, 
at the very least, it's not very helpful. It's kind of like if you've read 1984, they're talking about how Newspeak will eventually advance to a point where you only need one word that will signify everything. And that's both laughable and terrifying. It's absurd. Because of course you can't just have one word that means everything. It's just not how language works. And Deleuze and Guattari seem to think that's not how philosophy works either. The connection, like I said with the, the so sort quote, the connection between language and linguistics and philosophy, the dialogue between those two disciplines within the broader continental tradition is a kind of a staple of that tradition in philosophy. And we'll see a lot more of that coming up in this work.